I like your example of the orange uh, mm -hmm. slicing it. I was wondering, do you have any uh, puzzles or situations like that that children could learn from uh, at a young age, the, the benefits of negotiating and seeing the other side? You know, this is to me one of the great challenges because when I, you know, I've taught negotiation now for, you know, for many, many years to all kinds of audiences from university students to lawyers to business people to diplomats to or you name it, around the world, but I always think I'm engaged in remedial education because the best time for it to learn is as kids, right? And, and there are now programs that in schools, uh, experimental programs in schools around the country, in fact, around the world, which are introducing these skills with various kinds of curricula, with various kinds of puzzles and things, or even picture books, or uh, making kids a peer mediator so they go out in the playground, they learn those skills. And I think that's, that's the hope for the world, because these are, this is, these are such fundamental skills, they need to be learned at, you know, at an early age. And as all of us can testify, kids learn to negotiate very early, and this is the time to actually hone those skills, as any of you or parents know. Great. So you talked about a couple of things about going to the balcony and also learning yeah. yourself. I wanted to know if you could share any other creative current thoughts you have on impasse. On impasse, yeah. One thing is, uh, one, I always like to think in terms of visual metaphors, and there's a, a visual metaphor I've always liked, which is, which I call building the other side a golden bridge. Because when you're at an impasse, for example, your mind might be here. The other side's mind may still be way over here. And if you think about a negotiation, what we're doing is we're over here in our position, what we want, right? Our proposal, we think it's a great proposal. And we're saying to them, come on over to my position, come on over to my proposal. This is the way it ought to be. But if you put yourself in the other side's shoes for a moment, and you look at that same proposal, it's not so easy for them to go where you want them to go. Because for them, it's like there's a Grand Canyon in between where they are and where you are. It's, and that Grand Canyon is filled with doubt, anxiety, fear. I'm going to look like weak to my boss or to other people. If I give in, am I giving in? It's hard for them to move where you want them to be over here. And so our challenge is instead of just pushing them and trying to sell our proposal, which often just creates more resistance, the more you push, the more the other side resists is instead to do the opposite of that, which is to attract them, which is actually not so easy, but start the conversation not where you are, but over here where they are. Start where their thinking is, where their concerns are, where their fears are, and then see your job as building them a golden bridge over this canyon, over this chasm. Build them a golden bridge. In other words, make it as easy as possible for them to do what they want what you would like them to do. Let me just give you an example from the creative industry. When Steven Spielberg tells a story, when he was 13, there was a 15-year-old bully who would just pick on him, who was stronger, bigger, pick on everyone, but pick particularly on, on young Steven, beat him up, throw stink bombs at him. I mean, he, he had nightmares about this guy for an entire year. He would you know, run home from school, dive under his bed, call out safe to himself. And then one day he woke up and said, how do I get this bully off my back? How, in, in, in my terminology, how do I build a golden bridge for this bully? So one day he goes up to the bully, says, you know, I'm making these home movies, even then he was making movies, and he says, I'm making a movie about fighting the Nazis. And I was wondering if you would care to play the war hero. Well, the bully laughs in his face, but a couple days later, kind of grudgingly, he comes back and says, okay. And so Spielberg takes him, dresses him up in fatigues and backpack, makes him the war hero in his movie. And after that, Spielberg reports, that bully became his best friend. His best friend in high school was this bully who'd beaten him up for an entire year. So ask yourself, what's the logic, what's the psychological logic by which a bully gets transformed into a best friend? Why does a bully bully? What's the underlying interest there? What's the underlying motivation? What do you think? Fear, often insecurity, exactly. As bullies often, we think they're, they're often motivated by insecurity. What, what, what are they looking for? Attention, power, right? So young Spielberg thinks, okay, what do I have in my resources to give this guy a sense of attention, a sense of power? 
Put him, make him the war hero in his movie. That's how you do it. So essentially, in a difficult situation, an impasse, put yourself in the shoes of the other. Really try to figure out what is it blocking. It's not often the money. There's something behind it. Because even as adults, we all, ha we all have that need for attention, for power, for a sense of control, for a sense of security. If you can find the some, some way to deal with those basic underlying human needs, you can often build them a golden bridge, make it easier for them to move in the direction you'd like them to move. Another question here. Yes, ma'am. Hi. So I really liked your example of the Venezuelan president, and I find it easier to negotiate with emoters. But do you have any tactics for like a passive aggressive negotiation where you're just kind of not getting anything from the person? Yeah, no, those can be some of the hardest. And, and let me just say this. This is, this, this is just, you know, negotiation is some of the hardest work human beings we ever have to do. And this is where creativity really comes in. So you want to think uh, with someone who's passive aggressive, you want to think about uh, how you can draw them out. You know, how, you know, it almost like, I would almost like treat it as if it's, you know, you're, you're a scientist and you're trying to figure out how am I going to draw this person out uh, to, and so one thing you could do is take them aside, for example, from, because uh, often they're passive aggressive in, the, with, in front of other people, but take them aside and, and ask them, you know, outright, you know, it seems to me, you know, talking about your experience, you know, that, that you're, you know, you say you, you agree with this proposal, but it seems to me you've got some real concerns about it. Uh, am I wrong? You know, just really try and draw them out. See if you can figure out ways in which you can make it comfortable for them to share what their real concern is. See if you can, even if they can't do that, see if you can put yourself in their shoes and imagine if you were in their shoes, what it might be and see, if, you know, and suggest that and say, you know, the way it seems to me you're reacting, it sounds to me like you have real concerns about your job here and whatever. And see if, or see if you can find a friend of theirs and find out from the friend or someone who knows them what's really going on for them if they're not going to tell you that. But just, in other words, go to the balcony. Don't get triggered by it yourself. See that that's their way of defending themselves, that somehow they've evolved, and see if you can, if you can work with it. It's not easy, but these are, this, is, this is where we need kind of creativity. We need kind of to try different approaches. It's a little bit, human minds are a little bit like when you have a key in the door, you got to like try it one way, you got to try it another way, try it a third way until you find a way that seems to work. Yes, please. Um, hi. Hi. I actually had two questions. I was negotiating which one to ask. <laughs> but I Negotiating don't... with yourself. Yes. Um, so uh, you were suggesting the Vatna process but I, just, I was just wondering, how do you use it when you're nego negotiating with yourself? How do you use oh, that? When, when you negotiate, yeah. Well, the thing is, one of the things to me is, um, you know, oftentimes when you look at your BATNA, uh, your alternative, you know, it may look like, you know, I don't have a BATNA. You know, I have to, you know, I, 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 I have to reach an agreement with this person. Uh, when you do that psychologically, you make yourself a little bit like hostage of that person. Uh, but you might think that. The th key thing to do is to look at what I call your inner batna. And that's, that's the inner aspect of a batna. There's an outer aspect of a batna of, okay, if I don't get this job, I can find another job. The inner batna is your commitment to yourself having looked at what your underlying interests are, let's say you want the job for, you know, you ask yourself, why do I need that job? Well, I need a sense of financial security. I need this. Your commitment to yourself that no matter what, and that's the key phrase, no matter what happens, you will take care, you will take care and make sure that need is satisfied. In other words, if you could look inside yourself and say, it doesn't really matter what happens in this negotiation, I will take care of that need. Then you're going to go in with more confidence. Your inner batna is something you can carry with you no matter whether you have an outer batna or not. So to me, that's, that's the key, is that, 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 that ability to reassure yourself, understanding what your interests are and saying, I will make sure that my deepest needs are met. If you can reassure yourself, then you're not so dependent on the other side. And paradoxically, you're much more likely to have a better relationship with the other side if you're not so dependent on them.